Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ilsa Connect, and I'm the Deputy Director of Public Policy for the National Center for Victims of Crime. And as our final participants are logging in today, I want to welcome you to our webinar, A Prosecutor's Perspective on Innovative Uses of DNA. Um, a couple housekeeping issues. Uh, if you, uh, well, of course, if you're not hearing audio, you can't hear me now anyway, but this slide is for folks who are having trouble um, with their audio. So I'm just going to sit here for just a second and let them read this slide. I want to remind folks, if you have technical problems during the webinar, please call WebEx support at 866-229-3239. And a note for everyone that all participants today are muted upon entry into the call. So that means that you will not be able to ask a question verbally, but we do encourage you to ask a question using the question and answer tool in the WebEx system. I'm going to switch participants to a full screen view for a minute just to show you how your screen will look during the presentation and how to find the question and answer tool. Okay, so here is the full screen view. Um, if you look at the bottom right corner of your screen, you will see a little floating toolbar. If you click on the question mark icon on the floating toolbar, that will open the question and answer panel. Okay, and now I'm back into the split screen view. Uh, the question and answer panel in the split screen view is on the right side of your screen. You, you will you may have to maximize it. You can see something that says Q&A and there's a little arrow. You might have to maximize that to see that toolbar. <clears throat> um, in either of these views, if you type your question in the small box at the bottom and hit the send button, that will send us your question. And uh, the questions are not seen by other attendees, just the panelists, just so you know. We'll do our best to answer all of your questions today at the end of our presentation, but if we don't get to it, we will follow up with um, all of you by email with unanswered questions and also um, some more information about where to find the PowerPoints from this, for this presentation. And I also want to let you know that the chat function is not enabled for this webinar, so if you do need to reach us, use the question and answer tool. When you logged in, you may have noticed that we had a, we actually still have a poll here um, at the right side of your screen. We hope that everyone gets a chance to answer the poll. Um, if you haven't done it yet, please do so, because we'll close it in about a minute. Uh, don't forget to hit the submit button when you answer your um, poll so to send us your answers. And I want to make a note for prosecutors and attorneys on the line. We have not formally applied for CLEs for this, but if you would like to try to apply on your own, feel free to email me and I will help you um, as well as I can with whatever documentation you need. Looks like some more polls are still coming in. So we'll wait just another minute. Um, <clears throat> we're very pleased to bring you this webinar today with the support of Applied Biosystems. Applied Biosystems is a DNA technology company we have been working with for several years to increase knowledge of using DNA technology to assist criminal investigations. This is the third webinar in a series of six. More information is available on our website, and I'll give you that in a minute. Um, I want to let you know that on February 25th, we have Detective Joe Blozis. He's retired from the New York Police Department, and he will be presenting recovering DNA evidence from crime scenes. So for those of you crime scene investigators on the phone, you definitely don't want to miss this. Joe um, has a very rich history in crime scene investigations. He was the head crime scene investigator at the World Trade Center sites and um, has, was at and the New York Police Department for a very long time. Okay, I want to tell you a little bit about the National Center before I turn the webinar over to our presenters. The National Center's mission is to forge a national commitment to help victims of crime rebuild their lives. And we do this through direct support to all victims of crime on our National Crime Victim Helpline, 1-800-FYI-CALL. We provide training and technical assistance to those who work with victims, and we work with Congress to secure rights and protections for victims and um, secure funding for victim services. Since 2002, the National Center has focused on increasing understanding of forensic DNA and DNA technology because we do know that we can solve more crime and prevent more crime by maximizing the potential of DNA technology. And of course, that's good for victims and um, 
for the public in general. We have uh, and will continue to hold in-person trainings, so look for those in the spring and fall of next year. Those are one-day trainings and they are free as long as you can, you can get to them. We have created a listserv for those who are interested in DNA-related issues, and we have developed materials about forensic DNA for victims and professionals who work with victims. So this is the web address for our online DNA Resource Center. All the materials I mentioned, announcements for our webinars and trainings can be found on this website. And soon we'll be adding new resources uh, to this site, and we'll let you know by email when that occurs, but probably late February we'll be um, adding some useful information there for you as well. And this is my contact information. If you want to email me with any questions, or if you'd like to join our DNA listservs, just send me an email and um, I'll make that happen. Okay, so it looks like the poll is slowing down a little bit. Um, we're going to close the poll now so we can hear from today's speaker. I'll wait for that. One second, okay. Okay, here we are. All right. Today's speaker is Mitch Morrissey. He is a district attorney in Denver, Colorado. He is internationally recognized for his expertise in DNA technology and criminal prosecutions. He introduced the first DNA evidence used in a criminal trial in Denver and has worked extensively on the Denver Cold Case Project, where more than 4,200 unsolved sexual assaults and murders have been reviewed to solve them using DNA evidence. Mr. Morrissey is one of the lead proponents of using familial DNA database searches in the United States and directs the Denver DNA, <coughs> excuse me, Human Identification, Identification Research Project, which is studying the use of familial DNA searches in criminal investigations in Colorado. Working with the Denver Police Department, he has implemented the use of DNA to solve burglary cases and other property crimes. Today, Mitch is going to talk about using DNA in court, cold case investigations, familial DNA searches, using John Doe warrants, using animal DNA in investigations, and other innovative uses of DNA by investigators and prosecutors. And we are very glad to have Mitch with us today. And um, we hand the, the presenter role over to Mitch, and uh, welcome, Mitch. Oops, I think Mitch might be on mute. Let me try to unmute him. Okay. All right, Mitch, do we have you now? Got me? Okay, yep, I got you now. Okay. Well, also, yep. thank you. I wanted to uh, honor to be part of this presentation, and I wanted to thank the National Center of Crime Victims for, for doing this series on DNA. Uh, it's something that I've been involved in since the late 80s when I was uh, just a, a trial prosecutor and then uh, became a chief deputy and have been involved in the admissibility hearings we did in the 90s and, and putting on different forms of DNA in my jurisdiction for you know, almost 30 years now. So it's something that's been very important to me. Uh, I think that one of the slides and what I always talk about in my presentations is why is DNA important? And I think most of you know that we solve murders, sex assaults, and sex assaults in children primarily with DNA evidence. And one important statistic is that 90% of the crimes uh, where DNA evidence is critical, uh, the victim is a woman. And the 10% that is left, the majority, are children. So we are talking about uh, crimes where women and children in our communities are being raped or they are being raped and murdered and assaulted by primarily repeat predators that if we don't catch and if we don't get off the street, they're going to continue to victimize people in our communities. The DNA, obviously, uh, the primary use of it in court is that it is an accurate method of identification. And if it's, and not, if it's a whodunit, then DNA is really going to be important in helping you solve the case. It helps us catch habitual or uh, serial murderers and serial rapists. It's also important when we have, when we have uh, victims that cannot help us in court. Uh, also, my, my uh, slides stopped going through. Let me, oh, here we go. 
helps us provide evidence when uh, victims cannot uh, help us. We had a victim in our cold case project. Uh, she was asleep in bed. She was blind and hearing impaired. A uh, person broke into her house and raped her. She certainly couldn't help us with any kind of identification other than the fact that she had been sexually assaulted. We got a CODIS hit after working the case. We were able to bring the individual into court. He pled guilty, and he got a 34-year sentence to life in the penitentiary on a case that when I started as a prosecutor, the statute of limitations would have run, and we would have never been able to get justice for that victim. So DNA can provide uh, the identification evidence in those situations where your victim is blind, uh, where your victim is too young to testify, in those kinds of cases where the victim can't help you. DNA, to a degree, helps you reconstruct a crime scene. Uh, we had a homicide case where a man killed his, his grandmother and then moved through the house, uh, leaving blood stains. He first started, and primarily the DNA that we found, was hers because he had beaten her so badly and had blood on his hands. But then as he moved to the house, we started to find just his blood. So it went from her blood to a mixture to his blood. He had cut himself, and we finally found uh, the last DNA on her purse where he grabbed her car keys and stole her car. It helps support the credibility of victims and witnesses. Many times in DNA cases, sex assault cases, you'll have victims that maybe drug addicts, maybe prostitutes, uh, the type of victims that uh, defense attorneys really like to attack their credibility. If you have DNA evidence that supports what they're saying, uh, it's really helpful in those kinds of cases. And then, of course, what we all know that DNA is extremely important in exoneration. Uh, what we like to do in Denver is exonerate innocent people as early as possible. Uh, we have had cases where we have exonerated people for murder in as short a time as 72 hours. Cases where we had legitimate warrants to arrest the person, probable cause, probably would have ended up convicting the individual. But by using DNA, we were able to exonerate the person within 72 hours. What that did for us was then enabled us to continue the investigation, and we were able to catch the real murderer within about a week. Of, uh, of that exoneration. You all know probably about the DNA database system, but really the difference between the late 80s and the early 90s was we didn't have a DNA database. Now that we do have a place where convicted felons or arrestees DNA is placed and it can be searched through the computer, it really has been significant in helping us get those matches, those cold hits uh, that we need in order to get the name of individuals to continue the investigation. The way CODIS works, and I have the DPD lab on this slide, that's the lower or local lab. Our lab puts in forensic samples. They're uploaded to our CBI, which in any state is going to be, it's going to be the same system, local, state, and then up to the FBI system. So the first search is done at the local level, then it's done at the state level, and then it's done nationally through the FBI. Every state in the United States can contributes information to CODIS. The nice thing about it is it continues to search. So as people are added, uh, the search goes on. And then as other forensic samples are added, uh, there can be a match between the forensic samples. Many of you probably know that it's important that if you get, even if the reference sample of the individual you're looking for is not in CODIS, the fact that you can tie two unsolved cases together, maybe in two separate cities across the United States, then the investigators can start to share that information. Uh, someone might have a composite drawing or something that will then help you solve both cases, even though the individual's reference sample is not in CODIS. John Doe warrants, and in Colorado we call them John Doe filings. Uh, if we file a John Doe warrant, we really, it does not help us with the statute of limitations. We have to actually file a John Doe case. And the way we do that is when we've got a DNA profile in a case that we know that, that belongs to the defendant, uh, we will file the case, people of the state of Colorado versus John Doe, and we specifically set out the entire DNA profile. And what happens then is when the individual does get into the database, we get our match, we convert that DNA 
uh, profile, the Don, the the John Doe filing, we just file a motion to amend and we put the person's name in. Uh, our first one was done in 2005. We had an individual that was breaking into women's homes and masturbating on them while they were asleep. We had one in 2002 and one in 2004. They happened on the same block two years apart. This was an individual that was not in our DNA database. The statute of limitations is three years on a burglary like this uh, because indecent exposure is not one of the sex assaults that gives us a longer statute of of limitations. We only had a three-year period to get the case filed. Uh, we got it filed before the statute of limitations ran, and then Mr. Jefferson, who's shown here on the slide, got into the database when his probation was revoked, and he went to prison. We got our match, and we were able to then continue with the prosecution of those cases. Mr. Jefferson ended up uh, not only did we prosecute him on the two cases, but during the interrogation, uh, he confessed to a third case where we didn't have DNA, but because his MO was so unique, he would break in and smell women's feet and masturbate. Uh, he admitted to the third one that we didn't have DNA on either. We also have been using DNA in Denver extensively on property crimes. In 2006, we got a grant from the National Institute of Justice to do a study on could we use DNA to solve property crimes, and we've had great success with that. Since 2006, we've filed 466 DNA-based property crime cases. Most of those cases are residential burglary cases. That's really what we wanted to target. Uh, we've prosecuted 204 habitual criminals in that program. And to be an habitual criminal in Colorado, you have to have at least three prior felony offenses. So we have a tendency to get much longer sentences on these individuals. They plead guilty to the charge, and they get an average sentence of about 14 years in the penitentiary, which is about 13 and a half years longer than people get for burglary out of my jurisdiction. The most important thing about using DNA in property offenses is that we've seen a huge decrease in home burglaries. It's gone down 11% every year since we've been using um, DNA to solve these crimes. So if you take an individual that's responsible for 200 burglaries a year and you catch them with DNA, uh, you're going to see a big reduction in whatever property crime that individual is responsible for. We were after professional burglars, and we've caught 204 professional burglars in that program. We've got a my, my slides are advanced. there. We go. There you go. And this is just an example of we had an individual, a couple of individuals, a husband and wife team. They were um, they were hitting primarily a residential neighborhood in the middle of downtown area of Denver. It's called Washington Park. Uh, we had thousands of burglaries in this area, and the the neighbors, the communities went to a couple community meetings where the people were just outraged by the number of burglaries that were going on there. Uh, at one of the meetings, we told them that we thought we had caught uh, some of the people responsible for the burglaries, and we actually, it was a team. We caught them on one cigarette butt. They both had smoked. One, Mr. Weller was the major component that we found on the cigarette butt, and Mrs. Weller was the uh, minor component. Both were habitual criminals. Uh, Mr. Weller received a 48-year sentence in the penitentiary after a trial. Mrs. Weller uh, pled guilty and got a 36-year sentence in the penitentiary. Uh, but in Mrs. Weller's case, Mr. Weller testified that he had committed over 1,000 burglaries himself in the neighborhood that, we were, uh, that he was working in. And when we took this couple off the street, we reduced the burglary rate in that neighborhood by 41%. So if you can see those kinds of reductions, it's a huge uh, benefit to your community, and there is a lot of savings in using DNA in property crimes. We also have one of the most advanced cold case projects in the United States. Uh, we've looked at 4,200 cases. Of those cases, mostly rape cases and homicide cases, uh, we've found 1,000 cases that have potential biological 
evidence in them. We have worked through about half of those cases so far. We filed 57 cases. 52 of them are old sex assault cases that were cold and five homicide cases. We right now have two hits on two of our old homicide cases, and we are waiting for the states to provide us with the names of the individuals so we can continue the conventional investigation of them to see if they're responsible for those old murder cases. 2008, we received a million five to continue our work. This is a team effort. It involves the Denver Police Department cold case detectives. That's what they do. They have no other assignments but to work on cold cases. Uh, the Denver Police Crime Lab, who has an analyst who works these cases, and I have a team of five people in my office. This is all because of the federal funding that we've gotten in order to continue to work on these cold cases. During part of it, we realized that we were going to be dealing with victims um, that hadn't been contacted for years, uh, that may very well have not had a good experience with a detective in the early 90s or you know, didn't trust the police. Uh, so we, we set up protocols about contacting them and dealing with them. We also set up protocols around how we interrogated the suspects when we had a DNA hit. What we found is if we went to a suspect and said, hey, I've got DNA, what's your explanation? They would give us one. So what we determined the best way to approach someone was to go through the scenario, um, ask them if they knew the woman, if it was a sex assault, ask them if they'd ever been at the location. And once they denied all of those things, then confront them with the DNA. They either gave us a confession or they denied it. That was the end of the, the conversation. But they didn't then come around and say, yes, I had consensual sex with this woman. We already had them denying that they even knew the woman. Uh, we prioritized our cases. Obviously, we had a lot of cases we reviewed. Uh, but as far as putting them in the hopper for DNA testing, we tried to find the ones that were the most violent, obviously the homicides and the most violent sex assaults. We also looked at the age of our victims. Did we have somebody that was a perpetrator that was molesting and raping kids? That's somebody we wanted to put at the high priority range. And it was somebody also that attacked elderly people because possibly we would lose our victim. Uh, we've had a couple of successes where we have made the case, but our victim had passed away. Uh, we've had one where we were successful in prosecuting the case, even though the victim had died. Uh, we had a problem with our victim compensation program, our cold case, going back and looking at old cases. If we had victims who had not requested services and compensation for counseling, those types of things, within a year of the offense, then they weren't entitled to getting any of that type of funding. What we were doing was going back, breaking out these old cases, uh, talking to these victims, the other thing we were doing is bringing forward victims that um, may have been victimized either before our case or after our case. Most of the guys, every single guy involved in the case so far that we've filed on has a sex assault contact with law enforcement uh, at some other time. Most of them are in the penitentiary for ra other rapes that they did get caught that happened after our cold case. So we have a lot of similars, or 404B, what we call in Colorado, similars victims that we always try to go and contact and see if the judge will allow us to put that evidence of the other sex assaults in, especially if you have somebody that has a unique um, form of how they do their rape cases, how they do their homicides. It's extremely important to get those rape victims in front of your jury. And then, it, of course, we have to do the compensation. If they need counseling, they're being re-victimized, uh, we try to make sure that that takes place. Interrogation I've talked about. Uh, the one thing about this slide is, as you can see, our interrogations, if possible, are always recorded. And you can see that in the top picture on the left, the detective is going through the file. He's very well prepared for this interrogation. He has photographs at the scene. This is Mr. Jefferson who broke into the women's houses and masturbated. So he has pictures of the houses, and he first asks them if he's been in the house. And if he denies it, he has him initial the picture. 
then he will show him pictures of the different victims, ask him if he knows the woman. When he denies that, then he has him document that. This individual actually wanted to see pictures of the stain of his semen on the floor. And this detective, without missing a beat, uh, reaches into the notebook on the right side of him there, you can see in the picture, and he pulls out a picture of the semen on the fl wooden floor and shows it to Mr. Jefferson. And then Mr. Jefferson gave us a full confession to the two cases and also to a third case where we didn't have DNA. These are just examples of some of the type of guys we're catching in our cold case project. Mr. Glasser uh, was somebody that came up on a an old case, but he had, in between the time we tried him, had uh, served a sentence for two different sex assaults in a neighboring jurisdiction. The interesting thing about Mr. Glasser, he got convicted and received a 60-year sentence but we had the pre-sentence reports from the offenses that took place in between. He had gone through a, sexual, a psychosexual examination where he admitted that he had raped over a thousand women, that he uh, used to work in a uh, mortuary where he had sex with dead women and liked to uh, have sex with his pets. Uh, he was the kind of offender that we were certainly targeting and uh, we we're extremely happy to be able to take him off the streets for 60 years. Unfortunately, what happened is his two offenses in the neighboring jurisdiction, he was allowed to withdraw his plea, uh, was uh, released from the penitentiary. So we were very concerned at the time we were trying him that he was actually walking the streets of Denver on bond on our case. But we successfully convicted him and sent him to prison for 60 years. Uh, this is another individual, Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson was another one that was in the penitentiary. At the time we were working the cold cases, he had raped a mother and her nine-year-old daughter over 14 years ago. Uh, he was paroling. Uh, the day he was paroling, we uh, filed the new charges against him. He was moved from our penitentiary to our county jail where he couldn't post bond, and he awaited trial. And we were able to convict him, and he got 60 years in the penitentiary. A cold case project like this does a number of things. One. Again, I told you that the guys we've caught are sexual predators. Every single one of them has contact with law enforcement for another sex assault. Two, we send a message to our community that we're not giving up on these cases. I sat down with this mother and her daughter, who now is a, uh, is, I think she's probably a senior now in college. She was nine years old when she was raped. She told me, Mr. Morrissey, we we never believed that law enforcement believed us. We never believed they ever seriously worked this case. And the fact that you have worked it and you are taking this man to trial, you've given us a new belief in the whole system. So you get those kind of answers uh, when you do this kind of work. This is uh, interesting. I don't know. Many of you probably involved in uh, major investigations. If you do have a crime scene where you have an animal, uh, you may very well be able to use non-human DNA to help you solve the cases. I've been to a lot of homicide scenes where there is a pet dog running loose or there is a cat in the house. Uh, you, what you want to do is if you think that that's going to be something that's critical in your case, you want to make sure that, that the law enforcement agencies are taking reference samples from the animals uh, that then can be used to compare to dog hair or cat hair that you may find on a victim who's been moved elsewhere. You can go to my website and you can see examples of published cases uh, where non-human DNA was found to be admissible. And also there are a number of cases that uh, resolved with pleas that you might want to look at. Uh, plant DNA has been used in murder cases in the United States. And then in those cases where the AIDS virus has been passed from one individual to another in a criminal case, um, Viral DNA has also been found admissible in those cases. The familial DNA database searching is something that we've been involved in here in Denver. Uh, other than California, Denver's the one place in the United States that is actively engaged in familial DNA work. Uh, we have a research project that's currently working. Uh, the UK really is the place that has done most of the work. Uh, the United Kingdom has had great success with familial searching. Basically what they're doing is they're taking their database, which is almost the size of the United States DNA database, 
and they if they don't have a match in the database, then they are using a software that helps them look for relatives that may be in the database. Our research is primarily based on siblings and parents or offspring. Uh, I know this slide says that even uncles and cousins can be linked. Uh, the UK has linked an uncle in a murder case, but we have not done that yet. We are working on just siblings and parents and offspring in our research project. Uh, but here's some examples of what the UK has done. They've looked at 122 very serious specific investigations. Most of them have gone cold. Most of them are serial murderers or serial rapists. And they have conducted a familial search of their database and have worked through those. These are the individuals that they've captured. Uh, there should be every single one of them that they've caught. You can see are primarily males. There are two women. Uh, both women uh, abandoned their children and were convicted through a familial search because they had relatives in the database. The DNA from the child was, was searched against the database with a familial search. And I think both of these individuals had brothers that were in the database. Um, let's see. My, uh, are you guys seeing my... We're still on the familial, familial investigation okay. slide. Is it not moving for you? And my, no, it's moving. I need to. Sorry about that. They've got 22 uh, perpetrators. They've identified through familial searching. They've solved eight murders, 29 rapes, and the three child abandonments that I talked about. One of the individuals, one of the women, had abandoned two different children two years apart, and familial searching helped them get to her. Uh, but. Of the 22 individuals, many of them are serial murderers. Uh, one individual, uh, Mr. Kappen, who is up in the corner on this slide, uh, he murdered three girls in the 1980s. He himself died of cancer. Uh, they did a familial search. They got a relative of his, I believe it was his brother or his son, went back into their old investigation, uh, found where Mr. Kappen was buried. They dug him up, got a DNA sample from him and it matched the DNA from the three rapes that they and murders that they were trying to solve. The other country that is doing familial searching is New Zealand. Uh, they have a familial software they use. There are two success stories so far. They caught one individual for two different cold rapes, one in 1988, one in 1996. Uh, when he was brought to court on these two cases, he pled guilty without a trial. Um, and was sentenced to their penitentiary. And most recently, they solved the 2001 murder uh, through a familial search of an individual. They, he was not in the database, although he had an extensive criminal history. Most of it predated them, him having to be loaded in the database. And um, his sister, though, was in the database. They got a familial hit. Uh, there was a list of individuals that they were going to investigate, and he was number one on the list when they did the investigation. Uh, they were able to get a DNA sample from him and match it to the murder, and he eventually pled guilty to that offense. Anytime that you have cold cases, that uh, anytime you have exonerations, they're going to become cold cases. So if you have somebody that has been in prison for 18 years for a rape that they didn't commit or for a homicide, you're going to be stuck with a cold case. Um, and if you look at the statistics, this statistic is a little bit old, but the, but the percentage is right. Of the 212 exonerations in the United States, only 81 of them has the DNA led to the actual perpetrator. So when you get an exoneration, and hopefully um, we've worked through most of those, but when one does occur, now you have a victim or you have a victim's family in a homicide that you're in the same situation you were in. Uh, that you're in with your cold case investigation. And a familial search may very well ha help you in those situations where the individual is not in the DNA database, the real offender. So what we did was we put together a, a research project. Uh, really at the time, we, there was no one doing this kind of research in the United States. Uh, we were able to have some success talking to the Attorney General in California and they did a parallel research project with us after we discussed uh, with them that they really should be engaging in familial searching. And, 
actually that's probably the place where they will have some great successes because the California State Database has over a million people in it. Of course, here in Denver and Colorado, we have a much smaller database, but we thought it was important that we would start uh, this project. So what we did was we searched all our forensic unknowns against all of our knowns in our local D Denver DNA database. We used uh, software that was um, available. Uh, we paid the individual that developed it, but we also developed our own search software on our own. I had a scientist on board who helped us, and he, we developed a familial search software. What happened when we did the search, we came up with five separate cases where we had a 90% chance that the individual that we were looking for had a relative in our small database. When you have males that are related, uh, they're going to have the same YSDR type. So one of the ways that we either confirm or eliminate cases where the individuals are not related, our software may tell us the individuals may be related at a rate of 90%, uh, but if we run a YSDR test in two males and that Y type is not the same, then we know the individuals are not related. So we use that to uh, eliminate those cases that are those individuals in our database that are not truly brothers or father and son. This is an example. I think this was the third case that we had of the five. We got a 90% chance that we had an unsolved burglary where we had DNA on an earpiece. Uh, it was earwax that had skin in it that uh, gave us a DNA profile. We didn't have a match in our database, but our software told us there was a 90% chance we had the father of the individual that we were looking for in our database. Um, we ran the YSDR test because the father passes down the YSDR type to the uh, son. They had the same type. So we did a conventional investigation. We went and we figured out who the individual was. He was somebody that we knew well. Obviously, you can look and see he's been convicted three times of violent crimes in Denver. He was in the penitentiary, and he's serving a 96-year sentence for attempted murder and being a habitual criminal there. So then we wanted to build a family tree to see who his wife was, who his offspring were, obviously were interested in his boys, so the women fell out right away. And we were able to I, alibi the two sons. The first son and the second son were in the penitentiary at the time of our unsolved burglary. That left us with the third son, who was not in the penitentiary at the time of the burglary, but was in the penitentiary at the time. You can see his convictions there at the time we were doing our research. So we called the penitentiary, found out he had not been put in the DNA database. We asked him to move him up a little bit on their list. They did, and within two weeks we had a CODIS hit from our state database to this individual once his DNA was loaded in the DNA database. None of his, his relatives were contacted. The investigation is ongoing uh, because we do have another individ male individual's DNA on the same earpiece, once we can sort out whose DNA that is, we may very well be able to bring these charges against this individual. Uh, we recently did bring charges, though, against the brother of the person shown in this slide. Again, we got a 90% chance in our small database that we had the brother of the individual that had been breaking into cars, cutting himself, and bleeding in different cases that we had unsolved. We ran the DNA from the cars, the blood stains we found in the cars, uh, against the, the database. We got this guy as the potential brother. We took his reference sample. We found the same STR type, and we did a conventional investigation, which led to his brother. Uh, we obtained a warrant, and we were able to get his sample through a warrant, a search warrant. And this shows the parents and this shows the individual that we then were able to catch. We charged him with the two car break-ins where he left his blood, and he pled guilty. And as far as I know, this is the first time that there's been a successful conviction in the United States where a familial search software was used to in aiding the uh, solution of the crime. We widened the search uh, as far as our research went. Uh, we got the state of Colorado, who has our database, uh, involved, you can see we ran about 2,000 unknowns against 80,000 people in our database. Again, we used two different softwares, our own and DNA View software, uh, in order to show that we got the same results from different types of 
familial search software. We got 13 separate cases where we had a 90% chance that there were there was an individual that may be related to the individual we were looking for in the forensic sample. There was a 90% chance that they had a relative in the database. And we had 15 separate cases where we had a 75% chance that there may be a relative in the database. Of the 15 cases, uh, six pairs were male. In all of those, we ran YSDRs and got the same type. And in all of those cases, the follow-up investigations are ongoing. One of them we have charged as a John, a, a John Doe case, um, and we are just waiting to get the sample from the individual. We have a uh, warrant out to get DNA from the individual we believe is the person responsible for the crime. Colorado, ha in order to let us do the research, had to come up with a DNA familial search policy. If you go on my website, you can read the Colorado DNA uh, search familial search policy. The California one is there as well, and those are the two states that have gone far enough that have this type of policy. Uh, I, I'm confronted often by the ACLU around privacy rights around familial searching and uh, the constitutionality of doing a, conducting a familial search. And the, really the key to it is the Fourth Amendment. And is there a le legitimate expectation of privacy in DNA that you abandon at a crime scene. And I have yet to see somebody come in and argue that they have an expectation of privacy in, say, saliva that they left on a rape victim or sperm that we got from a rape kit. They have abandoned that DNA, so they have no expectation of privacy there. Uh, once you take that, that's the DNA that you search against your database. Uh, the actual individual who would match has no standing to object to that search because they are not in the database. There is no familial Fourth Amendment right. Your constitutional rights are, uh, they are personal, they are individual to you, so you cannot assert uh, a Fourth Amendment violation against, they searched it against my brother, they searched it against my sister. You don't have standing to challenge that type of search. So as far as the Fourth Amendment is concerned, there is no constitutional violation when you conduct a familial DNA search using the software. The only time you need to be concerned about that type of a violation is when you conduct the conventional investigation afterwards. If you were to illegally get the sample from the person that the familial search tells you to go and look at, or if you were to knock down the person's door or violate their Fourth Amendment rights some other way, uh, that's where you would run into problems. That's all I have. Um, I appreciate you listening. My contact information is here. Uh, don't hesitate to send me an email or contact me if you have a question. Uh, and if you want more information about some of the things that I've talked about, go to my website, denverda.org. Uh, go to the DNA Research Project, uh, DNA Resource section, and we have a lot of cases there and a lot of case examples there and a lot of materials around the different issues around DNA. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Mitch. Um, we're going to put our, our slide up here with some of the uh, resources for you while we take questions. Um, we have gotten some questions. If you haven't sent um, a question and you want to, this is a good time to do that. A uh, reminder, if we don't get to your question, we will uh, be answering questions by email, and those will go out uh, we sometimes promise in a week or so. <laughs> and um, let's see, we're also opening a poll on the right-hand side of your screen. If you can take a little time to answer that, that would be great. Um, Mitch, we had a couple questions on John Doe warrants. Um, one was about the, if there was a problem with the speedy trial when you file a John Doe warrant. You know, in, in my state there isn't because what we do is we file the case and it sits then kind of dormant. And we have not had anybody raise a, a statutory challenge as far as speedy trial is concerned because the individual speedy trial doesn't start to run until they plead not guilty in Colorado. So we actually have to get the name, uh, amend the uh, complaint information, bring the individual to court, and enter a plea of not guilty. I could see a challenge on constitutional speedy trial, but we have yet to see that. 
Uh, we have very long statute of limitations for sexual assault. In fact, there isn't one if you use DNA to solve the case now. Uh, but And in homicide, obviously, in first-degree murder, we have no statute of limitations. So we don't use the, uh, the John Doe cases in anything but our cases where we have very short statutes of limitations. So it's primarily our property crime project. We have about 80 John Doe cases pending right now. And usually about once a month, we will get a hit to one of those cases and be able to bring that case forward. But we have not had anybody successfully uh, challenge one of our John Doe filings based on speedy trial. Okay, and related to that, um, do you you mentioned the statute of limitations um, in in Colorado? Do you? The question is basically, what crimes do you think we need to rem to eliminate the statute of limitations for? I think it's sort of a general question, not necessarily related to only Colorado. Yeah, no, I, I, I well, obviously, I, I don't know anywhere where there's a statute of limitations on first degree murder, and that's why many of our cold cases. We are going back into the 80s and the 90s. The problem we had, I mean, the 70s. The problem we had with our uh, sex assault cases, even though our statute of limitations now, if you use DNA for any part of the identification, uh, there is no statute of limitations. We had a 10-year statute of limitations. So in our cold case project, we could only go back to the early 90s. I think our earliest case was 1991. But I would certainly think that most states should remove the statute of limitations on sexual assault, sexual assault on children, uh, many of these violent crimes. Uh, we don't have a statute of limitations on first-degree kidnapping or homicide or first-degree murder. But, I mean, most states should really consider changing the statute of limitations or making them much longer for crimes like sexual assault. Okay, and, and also related to John Doe warrants, um, do you know how many states have them? I think there's some that legislate it, right? Um, but maybe you could talk a little bit about whether or not that's necessary, and do you know other states that have legislation or, don't, or use it without legislation? Some states do have le legislation. Uh, you know, really John Doe filings were not – a warrant existed before DNA was really being used in a lot of states that had – provisions where you could file that type of thing. And and there's case law that supports it in some states, and there's statutes that support it in other states. But um, what we used is, uh, what we found was that our state really, ha it had a provision for John Doe filings. But, of course, the people that passed the statute didn't even envision the use of DNA and how DNA gives you a unique identifier that can eventually then you just need to know the individual's names. You know, I often talk about, you know, I've got people with five, six, sometimes 10, 13 aliases, uh, but the one thing they can't change is their DNA. So we have to make sure that we file the case, people of the state of Colorado versus John Doe, and set out that very unique DNA profile completely. If we don't do that, then it's not a legitimate John Doe case filing. Okay, it looks like that might be it on John Doe. Um, this question, um, I guess it's about viral DNA, and I'm confused a little bit, but what do you think the timeline is for this to go national and international? Oh, no, we're talking about um, familial searching, I believe. What do you think the timeline is for this to go national and international for undocumented persons of other countries? But I'm not clear that that's the question, but maybe you could talk a little, a little bit about um, the familial searching sort of going right. you know, more national. Well, unfortunately, the, the familial searching is kind of, you know, this is something that makes a database at states and, the nat and nationally we've invested billions of dollars in. Uh, and it's a database that could be run, run much more efficiently. Obviously, if the person's there, you get your match, you know, and you're, you start conducting your investigation. But if you don't have a match, that's just the end of the end of the inquiry with the DNA. Now, familial searching then allows you to potentially continue to get leads and makes your your entire database that much more efficient. The problem is that politically. 
um, it, it's a difficult uh, it's difficult to get familial searching on board. What is always mixed is the political move in the United States to get arrestee databases uh, statutes passed in the different states. And you know I've gone around with the FBI on this and talked to them in detail, all the way to the director. And it's my understanding that the people that were running the national database wanted to see as many arrestee statutes passed before they started uh, looking into familial searching. I didn't agree with that. I felt that familial searching could go in concert with these arrestee statutes and help us move forward on very serious crimes against women and children where we have serial predators that are out there that need to be taken off the street. So we just kind of on our own started doing this familial search um, work, and we've proven it works, and hopefully places that are desperately looking for that serial rapist that's working in three or four counties um, will contact me. We'll help you. We'll give you our software. Uh, we'll allow you to use our software. The problem I have is I can't do the political database, um, you know, getting the state database to allow you to do a search. But what this does is it gives you a lead that is based on science. It's based on biology, statistics, and genetics. And many of you that investigate serial rape cases and serial murder cases know full well that when you are following that tip, that anonymous phone call, and you're running that to ground because it might help you catch a serial rapist, you are running down thousands and thousands of hits or of tips and uh, leads. This is a lead that you could get that could potentially help you catch the individual, and I think it's an important lead that needs to be run down in those kind of cases. So if anybody's listening that has uh, you know, that serial rapist you're looking for, don't hesitate to contact me, and uh, I will offer my software and hopefully help you solve the case. The problem is that I can't wade through the politics of whatever state that you're in. Uh, it's just too hard to do. But if you have a DA or an attorney general or a police chief that's willing to do the political part of it, it put pressure on the people that run the database to uh, do this kind of work, uh, we will provide uh, the software for you to do it. I think the international question may have more to do with the arrestee uh, federal database. You know, the, the, feder the feds are now taking... DNA from arrestees on federal offenses and also people they believe to be undocumented aliens. Uh, and so we will start to see hits in our national database to people that come back and forth from Mexico or Canada uh, as undocumented aliens that are committing crimes in the United States and then going back to their country. That right. might be what that question is about. Yeah, I think so. She sent me a follow-up um, message on that, so I think that's right. Um, and sort of related to that, uh, I don't know if you know this answer, but <clears throat> what percentage of cases, um, I mean, what percentage of cases has the felon crossed state lines after committing crime? It's sort of a general one, but I thought we would do you give us Well, I don't know the answer to that, but what I do know is that we very often get uh, hits to, fel to felons that are in other state databases through the CODIS system. I couldn't tell you the percentage of them, but, I, but the Obviously, in a place like Denver, Denver is fairly isolated. Um, it's in the middle of the United States. There aren't a lot of big cities in even the state of Colorado, but if you look at Wyoming and some of the other places. So we are kind of isolated, even though we have a big international airport and all of that. What we find is most of our hits are in our state database. Uh, the criminals that are here stay here. And uh, we do get hits to other states, but primarily, I would say about 80% or more of the time we get a hit, uh, it's from our state database. That's because they like Colorado so much, right? It's a, it's a great place to yeah. be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we do get people that, because the highways come in right into Denver, I-70 and I-25, we do get those people that that are that are kind of, you know, just moving through the country, too. So that's why the national park of the CODIS database is so important to us mm -hmm. because these guys can be extremely mobile. Right. 
Um, it looks like we're, we're running on time. We don't have any other questions coming in right Oh, we've got one more. Um, this is our last question. Um, are defense attorneys using any legal challenges other than challenging the testing and collection of DNA in court? Anything we should be prepared for and take steps to ensure that it is not an issue when it comes to court? That's a great question. Yeah, there are there are a lot of issues out there that that they bring up. Some of them are are you know issues that they've been bringing up for the last 30 years. Uh, one of the things I've seen most recently is this Arizona study on their database where they took their database and they searched it against itself, every single profile, and they found a number of uh, profiles that matched at a I think it was a nine locus match. Um, you know, and that's really if you know anything about statistics, do you know anything about what they call the birthday game where you have a room of people and you, you you find the two people with the same birthday? It's really a statistical parlor game is what they've done. But we have seen challenges recently where they try to bring that up, especially if you have only a partial profile. They will try to bring that up to try to indicate that there there's possibly a lot of do a lot of people with the same DNA in the state database. Um, and that's something you can look into. It's it's on the web. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of examples of it. And then if you go to the statistical part of my website, the DNA Resource Statistical Cases, uh, I think the last couple I've added talk about that Arizona study. But that's the one that I've seen most recently. Oops, sorry, um, I had to unmute myself. Um, I think we're out of time. Mitch, do you, do you have any closing comments? Anything you want to note that you haven't yet? Well, I really appreciate everybody coming on, and obviously when it comes to solving violent crimes against women and children, this is a huge tool. And again, I'm more than happy to help anybody that is engaged in a major investigation of a serial offender that wants to look into familial searching. Tell them to just contact me, uh, my my email's on that last slide, mm -hmm. so uh, that slide for people. don't hesitate to send me an email, and I'll, we'll see what we can do to help. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and I want everyone to know that today's uh, webinar was recorded, and so we will make that available uh, very shortly, probably sometime next week. You'll get an email with that, and feel free to send that link to other folks so you can share the information and uh, visit our website so you can learn about future webinars. Um, like I said, we have one on February 25th coming up on recovering uh, DNA evidence from crime scenes, which is going to be a great one. So I want to thank you for listening and have a great afternoon.